ओके ओके या गुड गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू कर्नाटक इंटी हास्पिटल इनोवेटिव मास्टर क्लास ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी सीरीज ऑफ प्रोग्राम नौ इट इज बी चेंज वि न्यू इनोवेटिव प्रोग्राम दट इज कॉल इंटी ग्रांड ग्रांड रौंड i i am very fond of this uh, terminology grand rounds because whatever i am today what i have learned uh, is because of my grand round experience back at pj chandigarh uh, where i did my uh, residency okay that's almost about 23 24 years back uh, there is back at pgi we used to have every day two rounds morning used round used to be called consultant round where a senior most, most consultant will take a round uh, for the opd going uh residents as well as you know uh, mainly opd going residents and the evening rounds all residents used to be there that used to be uh, you know taken by during our times so by a uh, senior resident senior most senior resident uh, and those evening rounds i remember them to be grueling rounds so, you know we used to curse actually in fact that time you know when this rounds is going to uh, get over you know because You you keep standing for hours together, and uh, seniors and keep shooting questions. You know, rather those senior residents were like walking encyclopedias, quoting from journals, textbooks. Prahala, <laughs> not... Prahala, uh, somebody. <laughs> yeah. Want no audio? They said. Yeah. Hello, audio is there uh, very much. Uh, I think you have to check your audio. Okay? okay. Okay. Yeah, they have to check your audio. Audio is perfect. Uh, I think you are all able to hear me now, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. With the, with those uh, fond memories, I I I wish to start a new series of program called the ENT Grand Rounds, uh, covering some of the basic, basic, most basic topics. Okay. See, when I spoke to one of my senior resident, from whom I have learnt a lot uh, about his experience, you know, he is instead of being from PJ Chandigarh after having worked in UK, uh, being an FRC, he settled in a district place uh, like a Siliguri. and uh, imagine starting all together in a smaller place uh, you know uh, it has to adopt to the local conditions and all entire practice has to be uh, made you know a kind of uh, a change to the local conditions and he has done that so successfully uh, and he is he is sharing one of the most basic topic that is epistaxis uh, that is something to share after 20 years of experience uh, uh, he is share, sharing and for this session we have uh, Uh, uh we have another uh, pj alumni dr uh, uh, kabir you know uh, um, uh, see dr kabir was far too senior for, to me but i met him suddenly uh, one fine day at hyderabad during dr another senior dr k r meghnath's uh, uh, fes uh, life surgery program and we we hit it upon together and we became very good friends rather you know he is kind of senior mentor a uh, well wisher and what i like uh, most about kabi sir is one of the most gentle person i have seen in my life okay most gentle person uh, so he is going to moderate the session today okay yes sir so you can share the screen now i invite both of you uh, for uh, this thing uh, kabi sir you can uh, start the program okay invite uh... hello good evening to all of you is it audible Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ananda sir, about whom Dr. Prahala has already explained, he has selected a common problem, ENT problem, that is epistaxis, which we face in our day-to-day -day ENT practice. It is usually harmless, but sometimes it can be life-threatening, and sometimes it will be very difficult to treat. Dr. Ananda, senior ENT surgeon who has settled in Siliguri, is going to share his experience. and which will be useful to all the juniors and budding ent surgeons uh, over to dr ananda sir okay you can start the yes and, yes sir and all the participants who have any questions please uh, uh, put the questions i will note down at the end of the talk we will have question answer discussion yeah please post your questions in the chat area uh okay and all those questions will be noted and uh, they will be answered in the end of the during end of the session okay at the end of the session uh thank you uh, Do uh professor kabir and thank you dr prahlad for allowing me to share my experience in your teaching platform uh i chose epistaxis because this is something 
every ENT surgeon faces every day. And the funny thing is that, that these mundane things, mundane as it may seem to many, is actually quite a life, can be quite life-threatening and can cause a lot of anxious moments for patients, relatives as well. Uh, in a small district uh, place, you don't have juniors, so you need to face it head on. And I chose to do it a little different over the last 20 years. And I will share with you my experience of what I did when I didn't have much of equipment and how things have changed now and give you a little idea of how to go about it. I'm not going to talk about the different etiologies and uh, you know hundreds of causes that are there, the textbooks done it all. I'm just sharing with uh, you my practical experience and what has worked for me. So for those of you who are not conversant with where Siliguri is, it is in the northern part of West Bengal. It's a small place and uh, it's surrounded by the Kanchenjunga is at the, the backdrop and you've got lovely uh, tea um, uh, plantations around. Now, we are all familiar with this and I'm not going to allude to it much. And we were all, uh, when we finished our training, this was the commonest way that, uh, you know, bleeding is to be stopped. But I hope none of you, of you have had the opportunity of had your nose packed. It's really very, very painful. So, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is refractory epistaxis. Basically, an epistaxis which is continuing in spite of packing, no obvious causes found, and they form a significant part of our practice. Now, I'm not going to go into the detailed way of how history is taken and about the way a history is to be taken. I'm going to talk about from the ENT person's point of view of what are the things that when you go there as a consultant surgeon in a small place, these are the things which I have found have been very helpful. The first is to assess the amount of blood loss. Often they have had a trauma or an NG tube insertion, which may be a cause and you know exactly what to do with that. If it is important to know if they've had any previous episodes or any history of nasal obstruction, which will send warning signals to you, whether there is a mass lesion or a JNA of any sort, provided the age suits it. It is good to know if the patient is hypertensive or the blood pressure that has been noted by the nurses from the recent stress. Drug history, especially about blood thinners, is extremely important. Blood dyscrasias, if they've had, uh, if there is a definite history of that, you need to know about whether they are diabetic and you know certain other facts which might affect the anesthetic management, and you need to know whether they're allergic to any medication or not. But for the ENT surgeon, the most important history that you want is which side started to bleed, and for me that is very important because I think that is how I focus my attention on stopping the bleeding. Bilateral bleeds, by and large, are rare. They can either be very innocuous from picking your nose and causing bleeding from the, uh, you know, little area, and not only kids, there are a lot of other people, adults, who resort to this practice. Or it could be something ominous, like blood dyscrasias, leukemia, collagen disease, massive bleeding from an ulcer in the base of tongue, uh, or a huge hematemesis or a hemoptosis, hemoptosis. So bilateral bleeds, one must uh, think about these things and that's what I have seen in my practice. As far as investigation is concerned, some of the times you just have to get on with it, but basically a routine hemogram, a blood group, a coagulation profile only in select cases. I don't do any x-rays and CT scan only where there's a mass lesion or I suspect one strongly. But in case of profuse bleeding, your resuscitation and treatment should go side to side uh, along with the investigation. So don't wait for investigations. If the bleeding is there, one has to get on and stop the bleeding. Uh, computerized tomography, especially if you see a nasal mass, and if it's something which on CT 
uh, is shown as a localized lesion, it's so easy to do this and you can stop the bleeding. Or in case somebody comes with a bleeding with this mask, this is the one I wouldn't just touch. This is a new thing that I have had the experience of, you know, seen one patient only. So if you have a patient who is bleeding from the sphenoid sinuses, that patient needs an angiography with the facilities of an interventional neuroradiologist uh, because of an inter uh, internal carotid aneurysm. I've only seen one case in the last uh, more than 20 years. This is a new addition in the sense that because ultrasound and carotid Doppler study is available in most places now, in case you have to ligate the external carotid in an elderly, uh, you, this is something which might be good because if they have a stenosis of the ICA and you ligate the ECA, then the anastomosis between the ECA and ICA can get jeopardized and that might push the uh, person over the hill. So it is probably something I would do, even if you don't have it at the time of operation, you can gently feel it to see whether the, the uh, artery remains soft or not. Uh, the, I don't do nasal packing even after nasal surgery nowadays, but if I have to pack nowadays, obviously it's changed from the gauze pack that we had early and the post nasal pack with the two, uh, uh, which was, uh, strung in the front of the nose. Uh, normally we just do with the Foley's and I, if I have to pack, I only pack with a Miracil on one side. But what I do mostly is this, that is nasal endoscopy and cautery. It has to be a detailed painstaking uh, endoscopy and most of the time you will get the bleeder and once you cauterize it, it's very satisfying. The patient can go home same day or you know can go the next morning. So it reduces the patient's stay, you sorted the bleeding uh, uh, problem and it's very, very useful. Now, occasionally, you patients may not be cooperative and you might have to uh, use general anesthesia. Uh, rarely, because of you know, septal deviation, you might have to do a limited septoplasty in order to do a thorough endoscopy. SPA cautery, in case you are unable to localize anything and they've had lots of packing before and you need to do somewhere, uh, get somewhere, but most of the time, uh, you don't need uh, to uh, need that overkill. The way to proceed is that you need to anesthetize the nose. And I, what I use is uh, four person xylocaine and antrenaline to, uh, to uh, anesthetize the area. If I'm doing an, uh, under ge uh, general anesthesia, then I would irrigate the nose uh, with saline and try and localize the area from where the bleeding occurs. Now I have seen that if you concentrate on the areas where, if they have been packed before, if they have been packed before, if you concentrate on the areas where the pack has not reached, uh, you can get the bleeder. And it can be under the dorsum of the nose, it can be medial to the middle turbinate, it can be, uh, it's quite often in the inferior meter, meter, especially in the posterior part. It can be in the middle meters and in the inner scroll of the middle turbinate. It can be under or behind the spar. It can be in the quanal margin. And uh, this is a short video showing the areas where I have just alluded to. So you might have to infracture the inferior meters and go to the back to see where, it, uh, where the bleeding is coming from. Push the middle terminate to examine the posterior part of the septum as well. And uh, you know, go into the middle meters and examine the scroll and then go back and uh, see the quanal margin, and uh, you can either you can get bleeding points here as well, and also anterior to the anterior end of the middle turbinate, and even under the anterior part of the inferior turbinate. Now I'll share with you uh, the next video, which this is a patient who had been packed several times uh, somewhere else, and they came to me, and I, after detailed endoscopy. I was able to localize this small angioma from which he was bleeding. And, uh, you know, all, I, all he needed was just a cauterization of that. And that's it. 
he was okay and he went home without any further plea. So it's as straightforward, as simple as that with instruments like a suction, uh, your zero degree telescope on most, of the, uh, uh, on most occasions and a bipolar diathermy, which is available everywhere. So you don't need much of spe uh, specific equipment. I had looked into this record to see whether what I'm doing is working or not. And we analyzed about 243 cases of patients in whom the obvious uh, cause of epistaxis was not evident. And most of them had their control, uh, more than 80% with a nasal endoscopy and cautery. Only 6% had a ne negative endoscopy and most of them went home after one or two days. And uh, you can see that, you know, as I got experienced, I had more patients with, uh, with nasal endoscopy and cautery rather than ligation. Um, and, you know, hardly, uh, you know, very few of them were packed. And this was in the initial period. But once you get the hang of how to get on with these things, it is easy to do it. Now, this is an interesting place because we recorded these sites of bleeding. And as you can see, the septum is the major contributor where it is uh, in the posterior part of the septum in 24%. In the anterior part of the septum, that is the septum anterior to the anterior end of the middle turbinate. And this is high and this is low, H and L. The next uh, uh, bit is the inferior matrix, which is also very, very common area from which it bleeds. And, uh, you know, there are other areas which I've uh, shown. So if you examine the meati and the septum, most of the time you will get your bleeder. And, you know, cauterizing it as I've shown you. As, and there's no gender in, uh, equality here. It's grossly unequal and males are more affected than females. Uh, I did a, uh, haven't put that slide, but basically they are distributed all through the year, but mostly during the winter in the area I practice. And most of them uh, could go home within one or two days. Uh, a lot of the times they had to stay back for logistic reasons. If you have got a negative endoscopy, you can either wait and watch or rescope if there is a rebleed, or you can do an SPA ligation at the same time. And in case you don't have an endoscope and uh, you have only general instruments, uh, this is something I did when I came here uh, more than 20 years back in 1999, where I didn't have all the uh, endoscopes. And at that time, I resorted to the old practice of uh, external carotid ligation and anterior ethmoid ligation, and it worked fine. It saved lives. In these uh, last more than 20 years, I've never lost a patient of epistaxis. So uh, it's an effective treatment. And um, if you choose to work in a small place, it's good to get yourself skilled in this because uh, it not only saves lives, uh, it, uh, you know, it is very helpful for the local community if somebody really uh, can manage the epistaxis well. And this is a, a external carotid ligation where you expose this area. Most of you now are all trained head and neck surgeons, so it's nothing uh, difficult. So you open up that area. This is the area which you dissect the most, even in your neck dissections. So you can save all the, bra uh, all the nerves. You can dissect the lymph nodes off. You can uh, direct uh, you can uh, ligate the branch of the internal jugular and expose the carotid sheath area nicely. You identify, after retracting the IJV, you can identify the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery. And remember, before you tie, you must uh, check uh, that this is the external carotid artery. As you can see, you can see the superior thyroid artery and we are putting the ligature above that. Uh, and for the anterior ethmoid, you give the you give the Howard's incision, and you uh, retract the orbit, and you go back, and you can see the anterior ethmoid artery. You can buzz it, or you can clip it, and uh, you know it works fine. You don't, uh, if you just clip it, you don't have to cut it. 
even if you don't cut it, it works. But uh, it's a bit of a fiddle trying to put a clip there because you know you don't have dedicated clippers, and therefore sometimes it can be difficult to get there. And uh, you know when I got my microscope, I did I used to do transmaxillary, internal maxillary artery ligature, and uh, you know scars heal well, and uh, the patients can be managed effectively even if you don't have endoscopes and things. So take home messages, most important is which, which side started to bleed. Endoscope when it's hot. So if the patient is bleeding, if you go ahead and do the scope at that time, the chances of you trying finding out a bleeder and stopping it is highest. You know, I've already alluded to the specific areas and please don't forget the meatai and the septum are the main areas from where it bleeds. Uh, I'll share with you the history of this phenoid sinus bleeding because this is a one-off case that I'd seen and this patient was being admitted everywhere and every time she was packed and as soon as they removed the pack, she was bleeding. So I did an endoscopy and I went to the right sphenoid uh, area and I found it was full of blood. So as I was sucking it, she started bleeding profusely and I all realized that this is an ICA and aneurysm and therefore I quickly packed her with gel foam and conventional packing and send her to a neuroradiology center. Uh, so that is just one case that I've seen, but just to share with you that these things can occur and if you can't find anything, keep that in mind. Uh, when nothing, uh, you know, SPA ligation, uh, if the patient has been uh, bleeding, uh, has had several packings elsewhere and, I'm, and the nose is a mess, in those sort of a situation, if I'm not able to find uh, an angioma, then I would do an SPA ligation on that side. And if you don't have an access, anterior ethmoid ligation and external carotid ligation above the superior thyroid works well. I've done it even in elderly <coughs> under local anesthesia, and even that is possible. And if nothing is working, then you just pack the nose and seek for a second opinion. Thank you for your attention. Right, you know, Dr. Kabir, if there are any yes, questions, yes. that would. Uh, Prahala, uh, so very nice presentation. <coughs> we had a lot of experience by working in a small area in West Bengal, where he has seen a lot of cases and uh, he has shared his experience, how to tackle, and it is a good thing and useful for all the juniors and young budding ENT surgeons. If they have any questions, please post. Ah, oh, please wait. Sir, somebody is asking any role of TCA or chemical cauterization. I think if it's uh, if it's if the bleeding is situated anteriorly, then yes. But I have only chosen those patients who have not been managed in the OPD and they have been just bleeding profusely and uh, you know have either been referred to me with a pack or uh, you know have been seen in the emergency so okay. yes chemical cautery has a role uh, but uh, remember not to be too liberal to it because you start cauterizing the nasal ala as well and be careful about that but yes for an anterior bleeder that's fine i think i have seen this uh, small sticks of silver nitrate uh, for the small epistaxis, you can apply in the OP where it will be useful. And somebody asked, if you have a video of a spina pelton artery ligation during active bleed. Uh, I don't uh, have it uh, with me right now, no. Uh, Prahalad, you have any video about the spina pelton ligation?
what is the relationship between btw hypertension and epistaxis i think this i um, feel uh, is not right i think if you have hyper if you are hypertensive you bleed more but i don't actually buy the fact that hypertension actually starts causing bleeding well it might if you've got accelerated hypertension and you uh, and those bleedings usually stop as soon as you reduce the blood pressure but most of the time it is the stress which pushes the blood pressure up so i think okay. rather than uh, uh, you if you sedate the patient and you give antihypertensive if they've got accelerated hypertension you should still go ahead and uh, you can do an endoscopy and stop the bleeding and the bleeding will stop i think the basic thing is that if your pipe is leaking and you have got tank full of water it's going to leak more okay so for the for doing this silvernated cautery i have seen small sticks in uk but such things are available in india no when i came i came with a couple of boxes but what happened is even in our temperature the ah. little uh, silver nitrate uh, the blob that is there in the end of the stick kept on falling off okay. so initially for the first year i used to get it from uk and then i stopped what i do is i take the silver nitrate sticks and make it powder and dissolve in normal saline and uh, dip and then apply to the spot where you see the bleeding in the anterior part of the nose the place uh, where i work uh, i i don't uh, have access to silver nitrate i get uh, trichloracetic acid which i have okay any precautions in active bleeding sir uh, what sort basically you must make sure that the patient is stable and so put in a drip and uh, you know suck the airway out and uh, if you are waiting then just soak some uh, xylocaine adrenaline pack or if you don't have anything just some xylocaine and uh, otrivin pack and just uh, put in cotton uh, widgets inside the nose uh, which will act- at least buy you some time and you know uh, help you to uh, scope quickly can we put foleys and then pack when bleeding is more and endoscopy doesn't show any bleed well if you are unable to find anything then you will uh, have to put something foleys and uh, uh, merosel pack but what i am trying to say is that if you look carefully you can find out the bleeder in 9 out of 10 and that is what i am trying to uh, you know hone on because normally the bleeding management is left to the junior and the poor fellow you know he has to do something in the middle of the night but what i'm saying is when you go and become a consultant you're in a district and it's bleeding this is something yeah. it will not only improve your nasal endoscopy skills your management skills and if you can manage bleeding and you get more accustomed with your endoscope you know endoscopic sinus surgery is not difficult okay nowadays you are seeing lot of roadside accidents another question is how to approach a case of profuse bleeding following roadside accident rta or some facial injury most of the time traumatic epistaxis stop but by the time in those sort of a situation your uh, job is different it's saving lives at that time you can't do an endoscopy the face is badly smashed you got to put your merosel and foleys and wait but most of the time once your fracture and every uh, other thing is sort of sorted it stops i've only encountered on rare occasion on a rare occasion where a child was brought to me with profuse epistaxis forming a head uh, following a injury and the anterior ethmoid artery was rup- uh, was ruptured by a bone bony spicule so i went ahead and did a anterior ethmoid uh, cautery and that stopped the uh, child's bleeding but most of the other bleedings they usually stop once you reduce the fracture and do general uh, management uh, the bleeding stops uh, there is one more question about silver nitrate is silver nitrate can be used in which concentrations if you are using a solution sir i think you can take this because you are more uh, experienced in using oh, silver nitrate <laughs> i think it is uh, test books is already mentioned i think 10% i think prahlad should tell so we are 10%. using only 5% sir 5% yeah. okay okay yeah uh, what if a patient vomit when and what position to keep the patient to avoid aspirations well if you are not if you are doing it under if a patient uh, bleeds a lot what i do, uh, do is i turn them on their side clear their airway suck out all the blood clots from the uh, from the nose with a good strong suction put in my cotton packs uh, soaked in uh, xylocaine adrenaline or whatever xylocaine whichever is available there and uh, most of the time that's all that is required and the best time to scope is when they are bleeding 
the thing is because I've been in the front line and been doing it, that's why I'm so confident about what I'm saying that if it's just that we don't look hard enough and we are too scared that something is going to happen, nothing will happen. If you clear the clot out and if you can't clear the clot out with your suction is too uh, weak, ask them to blow their nose, get all the blood clot out and you'll be fine. Uh, posterior epistaxis in a patient having anticoagulants management because nowadays many uh, cardiac patients are taking aspirin. How do and you know it's a posterior bleeding? I think even in these cases, even in these cases, the anticoagulants, uh, if they cause bleeding, they'll cause diffuse bleeding. It won't be from one side. Okay. So if How do they manage? they'll have other mucosal bleeding as well. But if they're unilateral, I have on these occasions also done, uh, you know, seen septal bleeders which have which I've cauterized. It's just you need to look, but your endoscopy has to be extremely gentle and careful so that you don't rub on the mucosa at all. If you want to have a quick look at it and see if you can localize the bleeder, if you can't, then please do not try and uh, uh, you know uh, try to cauterize anything if you haven't found a bleeder. The second thing about uh, anticoagulants and bleeding is that. It's a double-edged sword. If you pack, it causes a lot of injury. And that also, uh, you know, um, causes a lot of bleeding when you remove that pack. What is the pack role of you have to use, you use the softest and the kindest pack that you can use. Okay. Okay. Role of laser, when and where we can use it? I work in a district. I've only used laser when I was in UK and in, the, uh, and in Chandigarh. I don't have access to laser, yes. so I don't worry about laser. Okay, sir. Uh, many participants have complimented that this is a great presentation. There is one more question. Thank Can you. we use adrenaline or jailomist back in hypertensive patients? Uh, I think in a hypertensive patient, using uh, xylometazoline is fine, you know, uh, and uh, uh, using xylometazoline and xylocaine is fine. I think that you can use that. Uh, you, you know, you, if you can't uh, use adrenaline. But most of the time, if you sedate the patient, most of the time you'll find, you know, a little bit of sedation with midazolam also, the blood pressure comes down. And uh, if you've got an anesthetic uh, spend, your job is done. Sir, one more question about the uh, external character artery ligation. Uh, when to take a decision of ECA, external character ligation, apart from endoscope, not present clinically. If we ligate uh, SPA, but still bleeding present, what, what should we do? If your bleeding is continuing in spite of SPA, you have to need, need to local uh, try and see where from it's bleeding from. Because it okay. may be from the anterior ethmoidal territory, so you might have to go there. Okay. Second thing is, is, in SPA ligation, you have to identify the artery carefully. So you may have to go back and see whether you've identified it. If you're not sure, you go ahead and take the, uh, make a large antrostomy or do whichever approach, uh, approach there are thousands of them described. You take down the posterior wall of the maxilla, you can get, get to the IMA and you can ligate the internal maxillary artery. If you're not proficient with that, you can go ahead and ligate the external carotid above the superior thyroid on that side. How do you manage epistax in kids? Well, most because of they the don't cooperate it, and problem is that unlike adults. So how do you manage epistaxis in kids? Most of the time, the epistaxis in kids are managed with, uh, you know, your yeah. conventional treatment of lubrication of the nose and telling them, uh, uh, you know, uh, assuring their parents that this is nothing nasty and try and make sure that the nose doesn't get dry and show them how to pinch their nose when it bleeds. That's all that is required. I have had only two occasions when in a child I had to do an endoscope under GA. And in that, those two cases, each of them had a bleeding from the um, inferior meatus, from an angioma in the inferior meatus. But they were around about 10, uh, 11 year old. Not, uh, you know, I haven't seen any of them who required surgery, uh, you know, younger than that. So you said the anterior ligation. When do you? Diagnose that the bleeding is from anterior branch of the ethmoidal artery. And... Well, if you scope and you find the area, uh, you know, a, a, the anterior ethmoid area, uh, you know, if you look at the blood supply of the anterior ethmoid area, 
So, you, you know, that's where you start to, especially if it's uh, bleeding from above the middle turbinate area, uh, you know, that's where you would suggest that the bleeding is um, from the anterior ethmoid area. And uh, since I've been doing endoscopy, I find the, uh, I, have I, I haven't had to do an anterior ethmoid ligation now. Most of the time I get the angioma, or if I haven't got it, I get the SPA and I've, uh, uh, you know, uh, and it's over. I've never actually seen them bleed from bulla ethmoidalis or higher up in that area. I have not seen it. it Maybe it, 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 there are reports of people having seen it and, uh, you know, you know post-traumatic patients and they have exposed the anterior artery by doing, uh, you know, going endoscopically and doing sinus surgery and then uh, cauterizing it. But uh, by and large, uh, you know, you, you, know with, you can get away with nasal endoscopy and cautery in most cases. But anyway, anterior ethmoid ligation is not a difficult operation. It's uh, you know, just have to give an, uh, if you're used, if you are trained in doing external ethmoidectomy, I think that approach is very well known. When children are not cooperating and when the bleeding is profuse, how do you manage? Uh, if the children, are, a lot of the times, if you, uh, if you put in a little bit of cotton soaked in, uh, xylocaine and otrivin in their nose uh, and let them put it in, uh, a lot of the time you'll find that the bleeding stops and they let you see. So this is one point. Uh, the other thing is that if, you, if, if the kid is bleeding and you need to do something, that patient in nowadays in a private practice would be examined under a general anesthetic. Um, you know, sticking uh, any Merosil pack in front of parents, uh, it's very traumatic. Whatever do you do, if you have to do it, make sure you anesthetize the nose because it's a common mistake of not anesthetizing the nose before putting a pack in. It's extremely painful maneuver and you must anesthetize the nose. Sir, you'll see a lot of septal spurs. If that is the cause for epistaxis, is septoplasty indicated in such patients? No, I only do the septal spur if it is getting in my way and I'm unable to put my scope beyond. I don't, just because a spur is there, I don't uh, uh, do a septoplasty because the spur can cause eddy currents and if it does so, it will cause it behind it or inferior to it. That's where the angioma is seen. If the location is um, somewhere else, just because a spur, little spur is there, I don't have to do a septoplasty. I don't do any unnecessary surgery unless it is absolutely required. Okay. What is the role of cyclocapron and vitamin K in the management of epistaxis? Well, vitamin K is if they have uh, coagulation disorders, uh, you know, pertaining to the factors that you have mentioned in or in a cirrhotic patient who is bleeding or something. But those are coagulopathies and really they are not our topic of discussion, but you need to correct your coagulopathies accordingly. Uh, I think, uh, you know, tranexamic acid, I don't use it routinely. I probably use it only in patients who have had several packings and, is, uh, you know, both sides of the nose is very oozy or somebody with a negative endoscopy. And uh, in those cases, I might use tranexamic acid for a couple of weeks, but, you know, I'm not, uh, um, I'm more a hands-on person to stop it rather than medication to stop uh, is bleeding from you. Okay, so regarding packing, uh, there are two questions. One is, is the gauze or merosil which is superior? Second is, which ointment you will use for lubrication of this gauze piece? I missed out a part of your uh, uh, question. Okay, okay. Uh, what, okay. Uh, uh, is for the packing, uh, we use gauze piece and merosil which is superior. Second is, if you are using gauze piece, which ointment you prefer? Well, uh, I feel that if you're going to do targeted nasal packing, then probably gauze pack is which you can layer in properly and you can tuck it under the inferior meatus. And, you know, uh, there is an art of packing, which, uh, you know, uh, Professor Kabir knows very well that if you pack it really well, but that's quite painful as well because you can go under the nooks and crannies. So for an effective nasal packing, uh, a ribbon gauze is actually better, I feel. I normally use bismuth iodoform paste, which I get from a pharmacist. And that's what I use for nasal packing if I have to pack, which is now extremely uh, rare. Uh, 
the other thing is it depends what you have and if you don't have uh, if you have Merosil there and that's the only thing is available for you uh, it's easy just uh, you know quote it a little when you're putting in it and for heaven's sake lift up the tip of the nose when you're putting it and know that the floor of the nose is not going up it's going down so a lot of the people stick the Merosil up the wrong way you have to lift the tip of the nose put it in lift up the nose and push it along the floor Otherwise, your packing is not right. Okay. Because we have seen a lot of times in PGA Chandigarh also, we used to use uh, teramycin ointment and nowadays soframycin. If bismuthiodine is not available, what is the alternate? Well, I think a lot of people use whatever they get. We've okay. used uh, Vaseline packs as well. We've <laughs> used, uh, uh, you know, soframycin coated packs. So whatever is available, a bit of lubrication, but anything other than beep, you don't keep the pack in for a very long time because then they can get staphylococcal uh, syndromes and you know cover them up with antibiotics. And by the way, even if you cauterize, please anti uh, give them antibiotic because once the nose has been traumatized, uh, the defense system goes down. And even after a septal uh, uh, cautery, I've seen septal abscesses. So I think I give them a cover of antibiotics for about seven days. And there is a dousing. Nasal dousing. If there is a bleeding, how to make it, whether it is anterior or posterior? I think it will learn it with, uh, uh, with experience. You, you will know how to scope it. I basically try to uh, have a look and see whether the, it's above the inferior turbinate or below it. If it's okay. below it, I know it's the meatus. If it's above it, I look for the septum first. If I can't see the, anything in the septum, then I go along the middle meatus to the back and try and see if it's from the uh, from that area or not. Nowadays, we are using uh, Foley's catheter for posterior epistaxis. We can apply and then it will stop bleeding. Then how to stabilize that Foley's catheter in the anterior? Well, there are various ways that people uh, do, uh, but none of them are foolproof. What I do is I uh, pull, the, uh, pull the Foley's in the front and uh, you put some gauze around it, uh, adjacent to the ala, and then put an umbilical clamp distal to that. And that sort of uh, keeps it going. But even with that, you have a risk of ala necrosis. So you have to uh, be sure that you don't traumatize that area. And uh, it, 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 I, I don't have to use it so long uh, nowadays so much. What is the role of uh, water clot nasal drops? I am not a great fan of it. Not. If it okay. works for you, that's fine, but I am not okay. a great fan of it. Sir, you said uh, before packing, you have to anesthetize. Does xylocaine spray enough to anesthetize the nose? Xylocaine 10% spray is good, but it stings like hell. hell. Okay. And uh, so, yes. um, uh, you know, <laughs> if you ha don't have anything, you might use it, but tell the patient, warn the patient that, uh, you know, it's going to sting you and it stings. If you have ever taken it, you will realize. Uh, probably uh, xylocon 4%, uh, you soak it in uh, cotton or uh, uh, gauze wicks and put it in uh, with some vasoconstriction, either adrenaline or, uh, you know, you can what is it called? Or, uh, xylomerazolin is fine. Okay, sir. How often you need to do CT PNS for a patient of epistaxis? I hardly ever do it, only if there is a mass lesion or if the uh, endoscopy is negative and they have. Uh, uh, and they have been bleeding, uh, you know, not too much, but they have been bleeding. In those cases, I do a CT scan. You can sometimes get fungal sinusitis from which patients bleed. And in fungal sinusitis, your nasal endoscopy can be negative. And uh, so if I have a mass lesion or I have a negative endoscopy and I'm still suspicious that there's maybe something is there, that's the only st uh, stage that I do a CT scanning. Sir, what is the role of uh, tranexamic acid? and botropase in epistaxis. Is there any advantage of uh, tranexamax over botropase? What is the dose of I think we just I think we just discussed that. So we'll, I think, you know, if you've listened to that, okay. you know, if it, uh, if these are additional things. As an ENT surgeon, you have to try and hone off. In surgery, there's a simple principle. If there is a bleeding, there is a bleeder. If you catch the bleeder and stop it, that's it. If you ligate external carina artery, doesn't collateral develops, which will cause bleeding again in intractable epistaxis? It doesn't happen immediately. Okay, it doesn't happen immediately. 
and external but over a period of time definitely collaterals will develop but you know i have been in this area for quite some time i have not seen a single of my external carotid arteries rebleed and it is still a very good way of stopping bleeding if nothing is working for you then eca ligation if you are accustomed to head and neck surgery eca ligation is pretty safe and it's good and the, the funny thing is in ex, after external carotid ligation a lot of people complain of jaw pain i don't know how it works but uh, it could be that some of uh, some form of ischemia probably leads to uh, sort of uh, pain in the muscles till collaterals develop and it goes away but that's something i've noticed in a couple of patients i don't know exactly the reason oh. uh, so folis uh, you use for posterior epistaxis and you, to inflate the bulb do you use air or saline uh, or distilled water i use saline saline but some people say that if it bursts it may cause aspiration is it correct well you know i i i think you know if 5 ml drops it's 5 to 7 ml you don't put anything more than that in and and when it gups in your immediate reflex is to swallow Sorry. doesn't just go straight uh, okay. this into your uh, uh, airway the airway's protection is good is good for posterior bleeding uh, somebody has used merosil and uh, they push it it was worked well what is your opinion merosil. well I, i i think i think i am saying look beyond avoiding managing epistaxis that is what i am trying to look at okay. you know if the bleeder is in the inferior meters no matter how much you will not be able to stop that bleed okay okay so yeah. it depends if it's on the septum or it's in on the coronal margin which is accessible to that pressure that's fine any bleeding if you can put a pressure on the bleeding point it will stop so if you can't reach it and you don't know where it is and you're putting it blindly and hoping that plugging the back the bleeding will stop that's i think is a bit of an underkill somebody asked what is the amount of jelecane or jelemist we need to use <laughs> well uh, i think you have to do your maths and uh, you know that you'll get to know it uh, yes, you know sir. Sir, how much per kg body weight you need yes, to put your yes. jelecane and i think that's for an that's a separate thing yeah okay. so i used to tell our post graduates whenever you take a 4% jelecane pack from the astra company inside there will be a small leaflet which you usually throw it so i asked them just to read it has given all the instructions advantages disadvantages dose everything is given in those papers usually i tell them to read that paper it is written clearly what is the amount per kilo body weight everything is written usually we don't read that paper and usually i'll throw it if there is a bleeding from the septal mucosa can we cauterize directly or we have to find out the artery and then ligate well no that's what we've been talking about if you see a bleeder you cauterize yes. the bleeder you don't have to ligate the artery yes. ligating the artery is an overkill you know uh-huh. you don't know whether this patient would require Uh, uh, a flap a septal a hadad flap for for yes, for having a pituitary later on so why would you indiscriminately you know cauterize if it's not something which is going to be if you've seen the bleeder cauterize the bleeder that's it over you don't have to go and do an spl ligation okay what is the material to ligate external carotid artery and permanently can we ligate i use silk suture is a permanent thing if we accidentally cauterize the septum how to manage beyond the mucosa if you do it i think it is already mentioned that you should yeah. not do on both the sides but if you do cauterization of the cartilage what will you do is it going to cause I a septal the perforation only, the, the, the problem if you are doing i think if you are terminate and your septum very close by and you cauterize too much then what you do is at least put a splint in If you put a splint in, you'll prevent a sinusy, and that will be better. Okay. So nowadays, if somebody comes with a lot of pack, and I'm actually stop the bleeding, and I in those sort of cases, I put a splint on both sides because I know that this patient is going to land up with a sinusy later on. Okay. So putting a splint in, you can avoid a lot of problems later on. 
so does the other branches of get hamper in external characterization no no you, you if you like i agree about, about the superior thyroid artery you're okay there are uh, there are um, other communicating channels for the other places so uh, you know there's no harm done if you uh, like it the only thing is you got to make sure that your ica is okay so if in in an elderly you're ligating you must make sure that that ica is patent or you need to know about the that's why i mentioned that in an elderly probably it would be safer to do a color doppler before you use it before color, that's uh, doppler already. with carotids yeah I think you have answered almost uh, all the questions posted, and very good information you have given about the epistaxis and its management. And I feel it will be very useful for the budding ENT surgeons and uh, refreshment for the seniors also. How many days should we put this splint? Yes, I felt. You said Sorry, splint. Sir. I... Your audio got interrupted. Okay, sir. How many days will you keep this Can splint? Can repeat that question? Uh, how many days should we put this splint? Oh, splint. I two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. I take it out after two weeks. Uh, for a recurrent epistaxis, do you advise septoplasty? Uh, if I think. Most of the time in recurrent epistaxis, you've missed the point from where the bleeding is. Yes. I don't do uh, I don't do uh, routine septoplasties for recurrent epistaxis. I don't think that's oh. the management. I, I think it's a bit unscientific to go that way. If you haven't found the cause, just straightening the septum, I don't think it really is uh, re really helps. No, I don't do it. Oh. I think some some more. Uh, charts appreciating your presentation and your answers and they said it was very useful thank you because the reason what i'm saying is that yes. not everybody is going to have when they start their practice there won't be people lining up to have uh, you know their fes and jnas and their glomas jugulares yes, and yes. their acoustic neuromas you will be faced with something with which you can keep your skill and you can give an effective treatment to them with less amount of pain and uh, uh, suffering and they can go home quickly and that's going to be good for your skill and for your practice and for the patient so all yes. around it's a win-win situation yes it is very surprising that after getting training from chandigarh and then uk you have gone and settled in a small place uh, and you are doing a lot of good service to the people who really need it well, uh, actually, we I think it's very satisfying because yes. I feel a lot of the times the districts are not well served and, uh, you know, they need good doctors who get trained. There are a lot of people, uh, you know, in the city trying to get a foothold there and, you know, trying to practice. But if they go to the city, there's plenty of uh, in the district. There's plenty of work. You can have, as you can see, I chose this area because I found Calcutta was very polluted at that time coming back from yes, UK. Sir. So I settled here and I went on my, my mountain hikes and my forest, uh, uh, you know, going out yes, into the yes. forest and I've enjoyed nature. And uh, you, you can work less hours and have a good quality of life. And, you know, yeah. nowadays districts are well connected. So your quality of life is not too bad. You're having a very good uh, oxygen fully oxygen and then city and then you are enjoying the nature as well as your practice sir one more question has come up can we ligate both spa in the same sitting uh, i think then you haven't got the main point of the discussion that means you have not uh, found out which side started to bleed if they have bi bilateral if you, if you don't if you don't know which side to bleed how are you sure that you know, ligating both SPAs are going to stop the bleeding. I, I, I wouldn't buy that argument. You might okay. have to do it in probably a very rare situation, but yes. I have never gone and ligated both the external carotids or both the SPAs. Yes, I've yes. probably gone and done the endoscopy again. What I'm saying is initially you'll have to pay, spend some time, do it painstakingly. 
only then you will get to where it is. Now, I, if a patient comes with bleeding within half an hour, the patient is done. Okay. That means you have to do uh, endoscopy and find out which side is bleeding. If it is both, then which is dominating, I think only on that side you will do it. Not necessary most of the times to do both uh, SPA ligation. As I had mentioned, sir, that yes, sir. a lot of the lot of now we are doing a lot of skull based surgery and all those things are happening. Yes, yes. And if you jeopardize both the SPAs, just because you have not been good enough to, to find, find out it. the bleeding on one side, is that justified? Definitely not. If still somebody is having questions, you can mail to Dr. Prahalad. He will, uh, he may convey to Dr. Yeah, yeah, Anand sure. and then you will get the answer and it will be answered. Certainly. And those who could not uh, answer our question in this uh, webinar, don't feel. And then you can send all the questions to Dr. Prahalad. Yeah, he, yeah. Will he will transfer to Dr. Anand and he will get the answers to your yeah. mail. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I'll do uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, sirs. Uh, wonderful okay. uh, presentation as well as uh, discussion. You know, the discussion lasted more than the presentation time. <laughs> <laughs> that was very <laughs> interesting. Yes, yeah, yes. Uh, this thing. And uh, I think that was what is what was more important. Yes. Uh, you know, clearing uh, small small doubts. Uh, yes. And this is one of the most essential and basic topics uh, which sir has uh, clear. Anand sir has cleared. Uh, uh, you know, uh, very nicely as discussed, very nicely. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, please, please, I would like to have both of you again and again uh, on this uh, platform. Give me more topics. Come back again, please. That's what I'm uh, discussing. Okay. I mean, I'm requesting okay. both of you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you Anand, sir. Thank you. But uh, making thank time you. Thank out you. of your busy schedule. Oh. And thank you, oh, Kabir, no. sir. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure. <laughs> and Anand, sir, one more request. Uh, yes. See, after hiding patients' uh, identification, can I post it on our website? People yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry on, carry on. I've got no issues. Yeah, yeah. Harry is right. Harry has already presented a few of my uh, you know photos, so it's all right. No problem. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. No, no issues. I I'm quite happy to share yeah. my experience with an August audi uh, audience in presence of Professor Kabir and you, yeah. because yeah. I think a lot of people in the districts do a lot of work. They don't present. And yes. I think, uh, uh, you know, these sort of podiums will give them an, uh, a sort of uh, yes. yeah, impetus to try and get their records and uh, yeah. Yeah. present it. Because you don't have any dedicated staff for keeping your records, it's really yeah. hard work trying to get everything yeah. together. Yes, we had, we had 127 participants from 18 countries, uh, from, you know, Indonesia up to Middle East and Africa. That's a, a quite a good representation. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank, Thank you, you all, friends. Thank you all, you friends. Think? Let us you know, join again next week, next Friday for this program, ENT Grand Road. Thank you all. Thank all you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.